Teşekkürler Yılmaz Bey. Şimdi OECD Düzenleyici Yönetişim Birimi Başkanı Nick Malişevi sahneye davet ediyorum. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure being in Ankara, and I'd like to thank the uh, Argonne Governance Academy for inviting me to um, to speak to you today. Um, I just learned over lunch that I'm actually the first person to give a, a lecture um, as part of the, the the Academy's program. So it's it's a real privilege and honor for the OECD to to be asked to do this. Speaking of the OECD, I'm wondering how many of you know of the OECD. Could I get a raise of hands? Who's heard of the OECD? Okay, that's good. Any of you been to Paris for committee meetings? few people? Well, good. So I, I don't really need to introduce the OECD then. As you know, we're an intergovernmental organization. Uh, we bring together 34, um, 34 countries around the globe, um, basically to talk about economic and social policy issues. And I, for one, am responsible for the OECD's work on, on regulatory policy. I'm part of the governance directorate, so we look at public administration, public management, public governance in the whole. But I just look at, at how governments regulate. And we look at this from a, from a process perspective, not from a content perspective. We try to encourage governments to put in place a number of institutions, practices, tools that allow them to regulate better. And, and, and, and for, the, for this lecture, I'd like to go into quite a bit of detail on, on, on regulatory policy. You'll get a crash course on regulato regulatory policy 101 over the course of the next um, hour or so. Um, so just to run through my slides, if I can get the clicker to work. Um, um, oops, I think that might be the wrong, let me go back. Um, okay, uh, we're at this top. I think it's important to reflect on what regulation is and its role, um, its, its role in, in, in government administrations. Um, I'm going to use the term regulation very loosely. For those lawyers amongst you, I apologize for that. When I refer to regulation, I'll be talking about laws, about subordinate regulation, about ministerial decrees. So kind of I'll be talking about the instruments of government in the round. Um, but I would argue that regulation is one of the three key levers of government. Governments can, they can spend, they can tax and spend, they make interventions through monetary policy, and they regulate. And I would argue probably that regulation has the biggest bearing on people's lives, on citizens, on businesses, in terms of these three levers. And for a number of countries now, I'm not sure about Turkey, but certainly for most uh, European countries right now that are emerging from this um, large economic crisis, uh, g government's ability to, to intervene fiscally have been severely constrained. There's not that much room anymore for fiscal expenditures. So again, governments are using regulation much more nowadays. Um, and again, it's certainly the case when you look across administrations, when you look across policy areas, regulation is hard, it's complicated. It's technically complicated and it's politically complicated. And when governments get it wrong, there are big impacts. I mean, oftentimes there are direct impacts from a regulatory failure but sometimes those regulatory failures lead to political failures, and I think that certainly was, um, was evidenced in, in the great economic recession and, and the, financial, uh, the financial crisis that led up to that. So again, when you regulate wrong, there are oftentimes severe consequences. And, and I would probably argue that, in fact, there are more risks to regulating wrong than regulating right. Um, oftentimes, very few administrations develop the evidence base to make good policy interventions. They oftentimes regulate when they shouldn't. They oftentimes come up with laws and regulations when there are probably other policy instruments at hand that would tackle the problem better. Um, I'd really point um, to the third bullet on, on rent-seeking behavior. Many regulations are created for private interest, not for public interest. Um, I've worked with a number of administrations to help them reform regulations. We have something called the Competition Policy Assessment Toolkit. And when you start looking at why governments intervene in markets, a lot of times they're doing it to help incumbents. It's a terrible problem across jurisdictions. Likewise, you know, sometimes you know, the private sector captures the public sector in terms of regulating. But I'd also argue that oftentimes the public sector captures itself. You know, governments, they basically say, you, you know, I can regulate because I'm the government. Because they're not doing it necessarily for the public interest. They're doing it because that's how they've always done it. 
So th there's something that we refer to sometimes as, is the status quo bias. There's not that much incentive amongst governments, amongst bureaucrats, to really look at why we're regulating and change. And finally, and, and importantly, regulatory failures don't follow administrative portfolios. I mean, if you look at the financial crisis in the United States, banking regulation was handled by the Federal Reserve and by the Treasury. There are probably four or five regulators that look at financial markets. Do you, you think the financial crisis cared about that? You know, while bureaucrats were squabbling, I mean, the, the American banking and financial system was falling apart. So again, there's oftentimes a misalignment between portfolios and between problems that don't match up. So again, there are lots and lots of risks to regulatory failure that I think you all need to be conscious of. Um, likewise, I'd like to talk about the costs of regulation on business. And these can be quite, um, quite large. I mean, we, we basically identify three kinds of costs. There are administrative costs in terms of paperwork, red tape, having to pay fees, taxes. Um, there are also direct costs in terms of having to change how a business runs, runs its business. Um, and, and there are also indirect costs. And, and I have a graph which tries to show these. And I'm actually going to take, um, take the microphone and, and maybe walk you through this. Just to make you aware of what these costs are. As I said, I would argue that this is probably to scale. Um, so, so these are these administrative costs. You know, like I say, paperwork, reporting time, fees and charges. Um, and and these, are these are the substantive compliance costs that regulations impose. Imagine a regulation on a construction site that requires hard hats. So the business has to buy the hard hats. That's a compliance cost. Now, most countries have really focused on just trying to reduce these administrative costs. I'm not sure if you've heard. I know in Turkey you've, re you've I think, reduced something like 14,000 regulations. I mean, that's all kind of in this space. But I think it's important to remember the fact that there are lots of secondary costs to regulation. Imagine a regulation that would limit someone's ability to hire an extra person. That person's out of a job. Imagine the foregone uh, purchasing power of consumers when there are limits to what they can buy and when they can buy it. Again, those are all secondary effects, and so there are lots and lots of effects. So these are kind of the costs of regulation, but I think what's important that you need to remember why if you're a regulator why would you be imposing those costs because you're trying to create certain benefits to the community and these benefits need to overcome these costs so again one needs to keep in mind the costs that regulation have on business very important and I'd like to maybe go through those just a little bit more um, what are some of these costs oftentimes I mentioned this the, the, the problem of capture and again, a lot of regulations either limit entry to markets or they create discretionary behavior towards incumbents who are already there. So sometimes, you know, there's just an outright limit. If you want to, say, become a construction company in Turkey, I mean, how easy is it to get in that market? Can you? Or are there certain preferential regulations that allow incumbents certain rights and accesses? I mean, for instance, you know, a kind of a crazy regulation in France is on pharmacies. So if you own a pharmacy, there can't be a pharmacy within something like 500 meters of your place of establishment. So that basically limits more pharmacies to come in uh, into the market. What, why is, what, what regulation, I mean, what purpose does that regulation serve? If I'm sick, I want to get to a pharmacy as quickly as I can. Why should I have to potentially walk a little bit further to get to one of these pharmacies? That's clearly a regulation that is discretionary. It's providing a benefit to someone who already has a, has a pharmacy there. Again, another point, oftentimes regulations um, create a mismatch of, of, of, of, of resource allocation for firms. Again, if you think about labor market regulation, and for, again, I'm using France, uh, I, don't, I don't mean to imply that France has bad regulations, but when you think of labor market regulation in France, oftentimes you can't fire someone for two years. Even if they're not performing, even if they never show up for work, it's very difficult to get a worker off your books. So obviously that regulation might stop a business from hiring someone in the first place. If it's going to be so cumbersome to get rid of labor, you're probably not going to be taking in as much labor as you want. So again, there's, a, there's potentially a misallocation. Imagine a, a firm that wants to grow quickly. Well, it might take a step back saying, oh, you know, I don't want to hire these five people because if my business plans don't work out, I can't get rid of them. So again, this misallocation mis of resource. And again, finally, these incentives to invest and innovate. Oftentimes, business people 
are spending time filling out paperwork, and they're not spending their time trying to come up with new products. Oftentimes, they're spending money. When I, if you go back to that, um, that, uh, the graph on the costs, they're spending money to comply with regulation as opposed to making investments. So again, regulations can be highly disincentive. They cannot disincentivize investment and innovation. Um, and again, you know, a little bit of thought about where the burden of regulations lie. There's a lot of research that shows that small businesses have difficulty complying with regulation relative to large businesses. Large businesses will have a compliance officer, will have a couple of lawyers on staff. If there's a new law in the pipeline, they'll be able to sort it out. But think about the small businessman. I mean, a small, you know, a small little business with you know, just a, a wife and a husband. And there are some new regulations coming down the line. You know, will they be able to react to those quickly? Probably not. So again, the burden is, is falls much, much, much, much more on, on small businesses. And I think in a country like Turkey, where there is a very large SME um, network here, and, and there's also a large formal economy, again, oftentimes those regulations force smaller firms into the in, informal economy. That hurts both the businesses as, as well as the government. So again, you know, reducing those burdens to make life easier for small business is quite important. Um, uh, maybe I'll skip over that. Well, obviously, I've talked a lot about the problems of regulation. Well, what in the heck are governments doing about it? Well, in fact, those governments that work in the OECD have been working on ways to improve regulation. And we in the regulatory, um, or sorry, in the public governance division, have been working on regulatory improvements since 1995. Um, th those are kind of a list of sort of the normative documents, the best practices. We've produced, and, and I'll point you to the last one. In 2012, um, we came up with a recommendation to the OECD Council on, on regulatory policy and governance, and, and a reprint of that is, is available in the books that you picked up um, with, a, with a Turkish language translation. This basically is OECD soft law. This is the latest thinking that we have on what good regulatory practices entail. And, and I'll, for the rest of the time, I'll, I'll kind of walk you through that. And just in a nutshell, when we talk about regulatory policy, in some other places this is referred to as better regulation, we're basically trying to find ways to allow the public sector to improve outcomes by looking at how they design and deliver regulation. We're looking at regulation making across the board, both upstream in terms of policy units that, that create regulation, and further downstream, where regulation is actually implemented. And it's also important that we look outside of government to civil society, to NGOs who have a, a vitally important role in, in, in regulation. Um, it's important not to mistake better regulation for deregulation. We're not advocating for less regulation. We're not advocating for a pro-business agenda. We're trying to advocate for better regulation. We're trying to advocate for allowing markets to work better. So again, I mean, th oftentimes this is, you know, this is seen as being pro-business, but again, it's pro-market, and I think there's an important distinction to, to be made there. And likewise, whereas oftentimes when you think about regulatory policy, you're usually thinking about economic outcomes, but there are some very important tangible governance outcomes from doing what I'm going to describe to you. These, these basically accrue through governments being more transparent in terms of how they regulate. It's being more open how you regulate. It's being more accountable. So these are all, it's, it's creating a better rule of law. Um, so again, these are all very important governance outcomes if you do the things I'm going to describe in, in a few minutes. Now, in a nutshell, basically the, the document in front of you um, can be divided kind of into four component parts. And, the, and these are really the pillars of, of regulatory policy and governance. One needs to take a strategic approach. You need to have some kind of policy statement or a law in terms of how you regulate and how you try to ensure that you do so in a high quality fashion. There are a number of institutions involved in regulatory policy. Um, there are obviously a number of public management tools which are really the instruments at hand. And finally, we've identified a number of governance approaches um, which I think lead to better regulatory outcomes. And I'll try to walk you through these three things um, step by step. Now, firstly, in terms of the strategic approach, um, we have some data. I'm not sure if you can read it. Um, we have some data in terms of how countries, um, how countries organize themselves from a strategic level. You know, is there a minister responsible for regulatory improvement? The vast majority of countries indicate that there, there is one uh, 
Did body within the government responsible for this? In Turkey, it's obviously within the prime ministry. Um, you know, are there standard procedures and a law that describes how you're going to go about regulating. And again, I believe that law in Turkey was, uh, was enacted in 2006, and I can't quite remember the name of it. But again, Turkey does very well here in regulatory policy within the prime ministry and also having a law and having standard procedures. So that's kind of the strategic approach. This is, this is sort of how you have it at least on paper, but not necessarily in practice. So how do you get working in practice? Again, and here I want to talk about the institutions responsible for regulatory improvement. Um, and they're broken down, I'd, I'd argue, into like kind of four separate bodies. One, one needs to have an oversight body, and I'll explain to you what that is in a minute. But again, we, you have ministries, you have policy units, you have the people who actually design the regulation. How many of you are, are from that? How many of you actually have drafted a, a, a law or a bylaw? Anybody kind of responsible from the legal end? Okay, a couple of you. So, you know, so, you know, one of the businesses of government is to create laws and regulations. Um, so again, it's ministries, it's these policy units that are oftentimes on the front end of, of, of actually drafting the black letter law. And it's usually regulators who are a little bit further downstream who are responsible for the implementation of those laws. And, and again, we have guidance in terms of how regulators should be organized, and also the whole issue about how you go about enforcing and um, um, ensuring compliance. So, you know, a big distinction between upstream, you know, ministries who design law, downstream, the delivery side. And also, I think it's important to reflect on the fact that there are bodies outside of the executive who are also have a role in regulating and have a role in better regulation. Legislative bodies, obviously, are vitally important here. Oftentimes, in, in many jurisdictions, it's the executive which will draft a piece of, which, which will draft a bill, which will then go to, to the legislature. But in Turkey, I just got this from a colleague of mine, approximately 25% of laws in Turkey are initiated, they're private bills initiated by the parliament itself. And, and that's a case in many countries, for instance, in Korea, something like, even though they have very good regulatory standards, something like 80% of laws are developed by the parliament. In Mexico, it's 75%. Those are completely devoid of any regulatory discipline. So again, it's important that legislative bodies become aware of, of, of, of, of this kind of work because oftentimes they're really the, the, the lawmakers. And, and also more and more, I'll talk a little bit about this um, on the next slide, there are a number of independent bodies outside of government who have a view on ensuring regulatory quality. So let me now talk about this oversight body. Um, we're basically talking about, on the second bullet, the, the regulator of regulators, or the regulator of industries. This is a body which does not regulate itself, but has some say in how other parts of government regulate, and tries to uh, ensure that the way that laws and regulations are developed adhere to certain minimum standards and are of high quality. Um, these bodies tend to be located in the center of government. As I mentioned in Turkey, it's in the prime ministry. In many other countries it is as well. In my own country, in the United States, it's in, uh, it's in the center of government. It's in the Office of, budget and, uh, be Office of Management and Budget. Um, Australia, like, like in Turkey, it's in the prime ministry. Um, so oftentimes they are like right at the seat of power. Um, but in some countries, they're kind of spread out. If you look at Italy, Part of the better regulation function is, is in the prime ministry. They look at the RIAs, whereas all of this implication takes place by the public administration. So in some jurisdictions, this function is spread out. It's kind of diffuse across government. Um, and as I mentioned, in a number of countries, and this is really an emerging trend, they're independent bodies that are responsible for regulatory quality. Probably the best example is in the United Kingdom. They have something called the Regulatory Policy Committee. And it's located outside of government it screens all of the RIAs and, and basically passes an opinion, which then the cabinet might take up or not. So it's, these bodies are completely outside of government, but they tend to be staffed by very well-known citizens, former businessmen, former politicians, lords in the case of the United Kingdom. So they're, they're kind of these, these real pillars of society, and their opinion really matters. The government can't ignore their opinion. And again, it's a view to see that with their independence, they actually might take this process more seriously than the government itself. It's certainly been the case in all of the reviews that we've done that there's a strong correlation between effective oversight body and, and, and the final kind of quality of regulation. And, and, I'll, and I'll walk you through some of those steps in terms of what they do. There are basically four, I'm not sure why I'm holding the phone on the mic. There are basically four key functions. Um, 
that these um, oversight bodies need to do. And they kind of go from least important to, mo to most important. At a bare minimum, the oversight body needs to provide training and guidance and technical support to using the, the various regulatory management tools at hand. RIA is, is a fairly complicated process, so someone in the government needs to develop the guidance to do regulatory impact analysis. Someone needs to do, develop the guidance in terms of how you evaluate laws and regulations. And that, that is like the first function of this oversight body. At a minimum, it should be a point of excellence and reference for using better regulation tools. For most countries, the regulatory oversight body is also a gatekeeper. Basically, once a draft bill or a draft regulation works its way through the system, they're going to be the ones who say whether or not it goes forward to cabinet or to the president for, um, for, for signature. There is the, a gatekeeper. They sort of are making certain that all of the administrative requirements um, that, are, um, that, that are sort of established in a law are met. Now, the third function, which is much more important, is this ability to challenge a law or regulation. They might take a look at the impact statement and say, this is bad. You know, you, you know, it's not enough to, just to have gone through the steps. You haven't done your analysis well enough. They send it back, and, they, and, and, and they're asked to do it again. There aren't that many countries which establish that challenge function. The US is probably best known for that. Um, it's called the, um, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, OIRA. Has, they have economists. They have social scientists. They have botanists. I mean, they have experts on laws and regulations within that body to be able to very carefully look at the law, to very, to very carefully look at the evidence that supports the law, and turn it back if they don't think it's good enough. So again, that challenge function is, is very important. And in my mind, that's really the key to creating that good regulatory quality, is having someone really challenge what ministries are doing. And finally, uh, we find it important that you might want someone in government to advocate for reform. Who's calling for regulatory reform in Turkey right now? I know that Ilmaz is, but who else is? I mean, you need people potentially in government to say, we're not doing well enough. We need better laws and regulations. And, you know, and, and, and calling on the government to, to, to change that. And again, there, there are only a few examples of this advocacy role. And probably the best example is in Australia. It's called the Australian Productivity Commission, which basically has a mandate from the government to challenge the government to do better. So again, those are kind of the four, um, the four functions. Um, again, just kind of a slide in terms of where the, where the oversight function lies. As you can see, for most jurisdictions, it, it's in the center of government. Um, if it's not in the center of government in a lot of countries, it's in the Ministry of Finance. Oftentimes, they do a lot of this kind of analysis. And in a couple of other countries, it's in the Ministry of Justice. I mean, the Ministry of Justice takes a strong view on the legality, on the constitutionality of various laws and regulations. So again, sometimes they dovetail it there. Um, just a couple of final thoughts on this. I mean, this is one case where it's probably not so wise to look to other jurisdictions to try to figure out how to create your own oversight body. Um, it can be, um, it needs to sit within the constitutional setting, within the administrative setting of a jurisdiction, and you really need to grow it, grow it yourself. Um, and, and again, I, it'd be interesting to know how, how this body is functioning right now in, um, in Turkey. Um, let's skip that. Let me now turn to the tools, the tools of, of, of kind of, of better regulation. Um, how many of you have done a regulatory impact analysis? Anybody? One. One person. Okay. At least someone will know what I'm talking about. Um, how many of you actively work with stakeholders in terms of consultations on various policy initiatives, developing laws and regulations? Stakeholder engagement? Okay. A little bit more. Okay. So you, you'll, you'll sort of hopefully be, how many of you have been responsible for evaluating laws or regulations on, on your, in your ministerial portfolios? One, two, okay, a couple, okay, good. So, you know, I, ho I hope some of these comments resonate with you. I want to talk first about regulatory impact analysis. This really is the cornerstone of, of, of doing good evidence-based policymaking. When you do regulatory impact analysis well, it should lead to more efficient, effective, transparent, and accountable policies. But the caveat is doing it well. Um, it's a relatively well understood methodology, as I'll show you in the next slide. The OECD has been working on this since 1995, and there's very good methodology developed on it. What's surprising is that the fact that it really differs, you know, across sectors within a country and very much across countries itself. So it's not used in the same way across jurisdictions. Um, tends to work a little bit better in common law countries. Um, 
and I'm not sure why. I think that it might be because governments are, might undergo judicial review, so they want to do it a little bit more carefully. You know, they want to, they want to uh, be basing policy interventions on the evidence because the judge, you know, a judge or a jury might kind of come back to them and say, you, you did it wrong. But it also tends to work better in presidential administrations. So again, I think um, it's important to reflect on how it's working here in, in Turkey. Um, but I think it's also the case that there have been some very notable failures in RIA, both as, um, in terms of individual RIAs, which completely got the, the science wrong, and also in terms of systems. There are a lot of countries that roll out RIA, doesn't really take hold, kind of just sort of withers away. Um, and I'll talk about some of the factors there. Um, you know, just looking at this slide, you know, again, there are a number of early adopters of RIA back in the, in the 1980s. That would be the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, and then slowly it kind of grew over time. But if, if you look at kind of the big, you know, upswing in, in 2000, in 1994-95, that's really when the OECD, in 1995, we came out with guidance on regulatory impact analysis. And that's really when, you know, kind of jurisdictions across the OECD, is, as well as more broadly, started doing it. So I think we can take a little bit of credit for um, um, for RIA. Again, wh you know, what do you measure when you do an impact assessment? What do you measure? Um, this is kind of some data that shows that for most countries, they measure the effects on the budget. In many countries, there's a requirement if there's a policy intervention, you have to know what the impacts on the budget are going to be. Um, but then kind of increasing, like, you know, not so many impacts on, on social goals. You know, again, you know, if you look at regulation, oftentimes there's, there's economic regulation, which, you know, is, is access to markets, as I said before, and there's social or, or environmental regulation. And again, it's a bit surprising that not all countries are trying to me measure social impacts, impacts on gender, impacts on poverty, not so many countries. You know, what, what are the impacts on, on other jurisdictions? Not so much, but, but you can see that you can do impact assessment on a lot of different factors. So again, one of the reasons why it's a tool that you know, is, is very different across jurisdictions. Um, and as I said, there, there are a number of, I dare say, problems or challenges um, with, with, with regulatory impact analysis. And, and I'll just run through those and again, maybe reflect whether these are applicable in Turkey. Um, one thing is, is the late timing of impact assessment. When you think about it, you, you want to do an impact assessment before you've started drafting a law or regulation. You want to do an impact assessment when you just, you kind of know there's a problem and you're not even sure how to address it. But in fact, in many jurisdictions, you know, impact assessments are done after the law has been drafted, after the decision has been made. So they're kind of like a, a justification. They're sort of an ex post justification for the, for the intervention in the, in the first place. So it completely negates the point of doing it in a way. Um, you know, on that last side, you can see that there are many different kinds of effects you can measure, but many countries sort of struggle with this issue of proportionality. What should you try to measure in a regulatory impact analysis? How many resources should you devote? You know, some countries have a, a law saying that every bill has to have an impact assessment with it. Well, you might have bills which have virtually very little impact on society. So again, you know, the amount of effort that you as a, as a, as a policy official, is you as a regulator might need to invest in doing an impact assessment will probably depend on the potential impacts. So the, this issue of proportionality is quite important. As you can see from my last slide, I mean, there's very much a fragmented approach to doing impact assessment in terms of, you know, there, there are all sorts of things you can measure. And how do you measure what's really material, what's really important at hand? Again, there's not that much guidance within jurisdictions on, on, that, on that issue. <clears throat> One of the hardest things in RIA is, is, is, is to quantify benefits. You know, as I, you know, my, whatever it was, my third slide, it's really easy to quantify the costs on business, the costs on consumers, but how do you go about and measure the, the, the benefits of, of green space or, you know, the benefits of, of greater environmental protection? How do we measure the benefits of climate change? Those are harder to do. They're much harder to do. And again, countries struggle with that. Um, Oftentimes, I'll, I'll skip that, that point about, uh, about consultation, I'll go into that in more detail. Um, what's kind of curious in many jurisdictions, there's no requirement to publish the RIA. Um, oftentimes, a bill goes forward without the evidence to support it, and again, that doesn't make too much sense in my mind. So again, this requirement to have RIAs, to have the impact analysis accompany uh, a, draft, uh, a draft regulation or a bill is, is terribly important. And again, you know, kind of back to my, my earlier uh, my earlier comments, oversight on the RIA process is very important. 
Who's looking over your shoulder? If you're doing impact assessment, who's going to say whether it's good or bad? Who might send it back to you saying it's not good enough, do it again? So these issues of oversight and challenge, I think, are, are terribly important. Um, i skip that. I'm kind of losing time. Stakeholder engagement. I saw more hands go up on stakeholder engagement, so hopefully this is something that's a little bit um, closer to the task uh, in terms of your own work. Um, stakeholder engagement is, is really probably the maybe the, the sexiest thing right now in, in, in, in governance and in, in regulatory governance in particular. And it basically kind of, you know, it describes the process through which governments communicate, how they consult, how they try to get participation from, from, from parts outside of government. Um, kind of, as, as Dr. Aragon said at the, at the outset, you know, I think, you know, public consultation, stakeholder engagement, it's both kind of an administrative act, a procedure, but it's also a mindset. And I, and I think that mindset, in terms of being more open to the public, is kind of created the shift from, from government or from public administration really to governance. When you're, you know, when you're very open to what the public needs and wants, when you get reactions from the government, when you allow them part to participate in some way or shape or form in rulemaking, that is governance. It's not you doing it on your own, but it's you doing, you doing it collectively, you creating policy collectively with the people who will um, be subject to those policies. I mean, that, in my mind, is, is, is, is truly governance. Um, and it, you know, as we heard in the, in, in the introduction, I think being open to public comment is fundamental to trust. I mean, that's really where, you know, that, that is the foundation. Those are the seeds which create trust. If you as officials go out to the people that you govern and are open to them and try to find out what they need and want, that's where, really where you create trust. Um, but when it comes to rulemaking, I mean, again, some data in terms of what are the requirements to engage with the public. And as you can see, you know, 30 countries have a statutory requirement for stakeholder engagement. Um, interestingly, in six of those, it's a constitutional requirement. That's phenomenally strong. Um, most jurisdictions, it's a statutory one. I mean, for instance, in the United States, it's part of the Administrative Procedures Act. So it's a requirement on the administration. Um, to, to consult, though it's not inherently part of the part of the Constitution, and also many countries have you know some kind of guidelines or, or a handbook in terms of how to go about the consultation process. I won't really have enough time to go into it, but there are very you know very different ways to consult, and I think this slide kind of shows shows it to you. I mean, you can do it through advisory groups. You know, most countries or many countries in Europe have always had a formal consultation with social partners, with trade unions. And, and, and with, with business. I mean, we in the OECD, in fact, kind of have a formal consultation with, with those two bodies. Um, but there can be informal consultations. You can create focus groups. Um, you can have, you know, like, town hall meetings. Um, and, and more recently, there are kind of virtual meetings down, down at the bottom. So again, there, there are lots and lots of different ways through which you can engage with the public. Um, the one thing that surprised me when compiling this data, the, the, the, the white bar, is 2008, and then the, the, the blue bars are, are 2014, is that there's been like kind of an erosion of consultation across all of these practices except for, for a few. So again, even though more countries are consulting, they're choosing to do it in slightly different ways, and we, quite, we haven't quite unbundled that data. Um, there certainly are lots of challenges um, with consultation, um, and in fact, some argue that there's, in fact, kind of consultation fatigue, that governments are doing it too much. Um, it tends to be the case that still lots and lots of people don't know that there are laws and regulations that are in the pipeline that might affect them, so there's lack of awareness. Oftentimes, they don't know how to participate. They don't know how to tell the government, maybe you should try to do something differently. So there's not a lot of literacy. Um, um, there's also, you know, importantly, information overload. Oftentimes, you know, right now, especially through internet platforms, through social media, the government, you know, is just pumping out data. You know, it's, you know, there's just this wealth, you know, governments are trying to reach out, they're trying to be open, and there's like this tidal wave of data. But when, you know, when there's a law that really might have an impact on a business or a citizen, they might not be able to find it through all, you know, through this huge flow. Um, so again, you know, it, you know, kind of, you know, it's important to, to consult with the public, you know, to inform the public on certain things and to consult with them on things that matter and making that distinction. It's also still the case in, in many jurisdictions that the consultation process is captured by, by vested interests, by big business, 
They're the ones who know how to organize themselves. And it's a small, you know, it's a small firm. It's the individual citizen who might not really have a stake in it. And also, you know, in many instances, people have a bad experience. They might have gotten involved in the process, you know, provided comments to the government. They never hear back from the government. The law doesn't change because of their collective action. So again, that, that kind of bad experience. So again, they, they, they, you know, there are a number of challenges that, um, that need to be addressed. I'll, I'll just focus on a couple of them. One certainly needs to have a bottom-up approach when it comes to consultation. I think you, know, you as policymakers really need to reach out to the people who are subject to the laws and regulations which, which you're responsible for and understand their needs. You know, you, you can't kind of do it from the top. You really need to kind of do, you know, look at it from a user perspective is something that we hear a lot. And also, you, you really need to move away from this box, box ticking exercise. You know, for a lot of jurisdictions, they say they put a law out. It's out there for 30 days. Okay, it's out there for 30 days. Tick, you know, you know and, and that's done. So again, really making it, you know, part of the process. Um, um, it's certainly, you know, it's important, you know, I, I, the, the, the fourth bullet down, the role of the, the civil service, there's certainly, you know, there's a need for a lot of training and guidance in terms of how you, how you consult. Um, and, you know, we're clearly moving rapidly towards digital consultation. Um, and, and again, you know, there might not have been enough thought in terms of what kinds of tools, institutions that you might want to create to do that. Um, let me move to evaluation quickly. Again, you know, this is one of the overlooked areas when it comes to regulatory improvement. Most jurisdictions, I mean, I didn't see that many hands go up on RIA, but I saw even fewer hands go up on evaluation. Again, a lot of countries, they, they sort of, they front end evaluation. They spend resources on, on evaluating a draft proposal, and they don't spend enough looking at the back end. You know, going back to a law after five years and really taking a look at whether it works or not. Um, I can skip over this. Um, there are a broad range of evaluation approaches. It's probably too many to go into, but you, know, you can just break them down into what we call sort of management approaches. These are kind of day-to-day -day requirements of every agency to undertake. Probably the biggest one right now, it's kind of flavor of the month, is what's called one-in, one-out rules. So there are, for a number of jurisdictions across Europe, United Kingdom, Australia, Canada now, there's a requirement that if you make a proposal, if you make a new regulatory proposal, you have to assess what its costs are, and you have to remove a, a, a regulation on your books for a suitable cost. So there's going to be no net increase in regulatory costs. Um, but also, if you go down, you know, what most countries do are, are like these red tape reduction targets. I don't know whether you've had one in Turkey, but across Europe, there was a call to reduce administrative burdens by 25%. All jurisdictions did this. So again, you know, every day, you know, agencies were really looking at ways to try to reduce, um, reduce red tape through these quantified targets. So those are kind of these management approaches, part of your day-to-day -day work. Um, a number of countries, these are probably a little bit more forward-looking, have programmed reviews. They're embedded in the law. For instance, Australia and Canada have a requirement that after five years, in one country it's five and in the other it's seven, after a certain period of time, there's an explicit requirement that the agency that put forward the law or regulation has to review it. It's mandated in the books. So again, it really tries to embed it in statute, and, and that's quite, um, that's very, very forward-looking. You know, for most countries, once a law is passed, man, they forget about it. They move on. But again, you know, building in an evaluation culture in a couple of jurisdictions is, is quite important. And then many countries do sort of more ad hoc reviews. Whenever they kind of feel like it, they might do a, a, a public stock take. This is kind of a complaint-driven re review. You know, the UK is doing this. It's called the Red Tape Challenge. So they're basically going out to business saying, which laws and regulations in the construction sector aren't working? They're getting feedback from, from, from businesses, and, and, and, they're, and they're evaluating it um, in, in those ways. So they're complaint-driven reviews. Um, but we in the OECD would probably advocate that principle-based reviews might be a little bit better. So you might have a principle-based review on competition. Like, as I mentioned earlier, we have this competition uh, toolkit. So you'll go about and see whether or not regulations are anti-competitive in nature, and you evaluate them against those set of criteria. Other countries are doing SME tests. So they're looking at laws and regulations, and are they discriminatory against SMEs? So there's some kind of principle, there's some kind of idea that you're trying to embed in the, in the evaluation process. So, and we feel that those might have more, um, those might have more, uh, more success. Again, if, if you look at what kinds of reviews um, um, countries have done across the board, primarily principle-based reviews, that's good. 
um, more of these public stock takes, um, not so many. And again, when you look at the, at the principle-based reviews, um, most of the focus across most jurisdictions has been on administrative burdens, less so on competition and on uh, trying to reduce compliance costs. But those are areas which are increasing, which I think are good. Um, again, you know, some reflection on who actually is doing the evaluation. So in the first slide, that's the, that's the government. So 25% of countries we, uh, we reported, it's the government that's basically evaluating itself. Um, but in a number of instances, they farm this out either to the private sector or to academics or some kind of other standing bodies. Um, so again, you know, just a couple of thoughts on, on, on evaluation. As I mentioned earlier, it's important to evaluate laws and regulations when they come into the system through RIA, and it's important to evaluate them once they've been on the books for a while. As I mentioned, there are a range of approaches to do this. Um, you know, some kind of should be the requirement, it should be your, you know, I would argue that, you know, you as policy officials should have some requirement to look through your inventory of laws and regulations on a regular basis. But again, some of those requirements come, might come from, from, from outside. And again, I think there's lots of good methodology out there, and um, we have lots of material on this if, if anyone's interested for it. Um, I'll skip that. And finally now, my last couple of slides, kind of on governance. And, and kind of, you know, a little bit about the governance of reform. I mean, I've been talking about, you know, the, the tools and the institutions. Um, you know, that's, that's, those are kind of the, the, the building blocks of it. But how do you really do it? And, and the OECD spent a lot of time on something we called making reform happen. And, and, and these are probably more critical ingredients to driving good governance through the system than all of the stuff that I've mentioned. And on my last two slides, I kind of want to go through sort of, you know, how you might go about embedding this. And again, kind of back to one of the first slides, leadership is critical. You really, this needs to be led from the top down. You need to have a politician, a minister, care about administrative reform, care about public governance to really push it through. So again, you know, it needs to be driven top down. It's also important to take a system-wide approach. You can't do good regulatory practice in one ministry on its own. You're not going to have these spillover effects. So you really need to come up with a better system to do it. As I, again, as I mentioned earlier, the context matters. You need to make certain that these governance reforms work for Turkey. You know, just because they've worked for a jurisdiction which Turkey might admire doesn't really matter. It's got to work within your own domestic setting, within your administrative setting, within your laws and, and regulations. So the context really matters. Um, it's important to reflect that these reforms take time. It's not, you know, regulatory reform is not something that you can write into law. You're really changing a lot of things across the board. And oftentimes, I think it's important to reflect that countries don't get it right the first time. There can be setbacks. But again, if you have that leadership, if it's institutionalized, that might get you over the bumps in the road. But for certain, there are bumps in the road. Um, it's important to focus on implementation. As I say, it's not good enough just to write the law, but you really need to make certain that some of these practices I mentioned, RIA, consultation, evaluation, that, that you know, they're more than laws. They're, they're more than administrative practices. They need to be carried out on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's also very important at the onset of any kind of regulatory improvement exercise, on the onset of any kind of governance program, is that you put in some kind of measurable outcomes and you evaluate those over time. So again, the evaluation function is, is terribly important. I realize that was Regulatory Policy 101. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, again, it's been my pleasure to, to do this introductory lecture, and I'd be happy to answer questions if there's any time. <laughs> Thank you. Otuz dakikamız var e, soru cevap e, kısmı için. Hazır Niki bulmuşken bence e, bundan istifade edelim. E, sorularınız varsa. E... Thank you very much for your uh, fruitful presentation. Uh, I will just uh, make consider evidence-based decision making. Could you tell us what's the importance of evidence-based decision making in public policy process, please? Thank you very much. <laughs> 
that's a, a really a really good question, and I think it gets at the heart of of regulatory policy, uh, and it really comes down to looking at this interface between the administration. I mean, you as technocrats and and and, and, and politicians, political leaders, and you know, I as an you know, I've never worked in government, you know, and as a social scientist, I would like to think that. You can do a RIA really, really well. You can talk to the public. You can know exactly you know, what your regulatory intervention is going to be. And you can give a minister a nice regulatory impact analysis. And of course, he's going to say, yes, you know, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to base my decisions on the evidence. But that's really not how you know, politics works. That's not how laws and regulations are made. And, and, I, and I think as technocrats, you can only go so far. I mean, obviously, you want to compile a body of knowledge, a body of evidence, which might point to um, you know, the costs and the benefits. And oftentimes, policy interventions, they create winners and losers all the time. So you might want to kind of point out who the winners are, who the losers are, what some of those gradients are. You know, there's not going to be this, potentially this clear decision. You might want to point to a couple of different alternatives. But again, ultimately, you know, the law, primary law, is, is left to politicians, to elected officials. So you can only go so far. I mean, I think you can show them the evidence. You can show them what the opportunity costs are of various proposals. But they probably have, you know, they have their finger on the pulse of the public. And they take responsibility for that. I mean, they're democratically elected. And that is their right to govern. I mean, they have a different kind of, you know, it's, you know, it's their responsibility to, to basically choose those winners and losers in, in some way that works within a democratic system. I think, you know, is, is, is non-elected officials, is, is, is, is, you know, is bureaucrats, you need to compile the evidence for them, but ultimately they're the ones who, um, they're the ones who are going to rule. Now, th that, that answer needs to be tempered a little bit in, um, in a country like my own, where there's a strong separation of powers between the executive between the government and between the, the Congress, where in the US and in a number of other presidential administrations, again, I'm not sure whether this is the case in Turkey, um, since you have a bit of a mixed system, in presidential administrations, lots of secondary laws, you know, secondary legislation is delegated authority to the executive. So within the Constitution, the, the, the government needs to, it needs to develop implementing regulations those are not subject to congressional approval. So this is a case where, obviously, you have to develop a very, very good body of evidence, but those decisions are subject to, to judicial review. So again, it depends a little bit on the context, but you know, pri you know, primary laws, you know, laws for, um, for the, the parliament, for the Congress, again, I think it's the role of the administration just to provide the body of evidence, but you know, ultimately, the, the RIA will not be the necessarily the deciding factor. It is one of one of the issues for consideration, you know, that ultimately leads to governance. But that really is at the heart of what we're talking about. Thank you, Nick, for your very interesting uh, presentation. I would like to ask you uh, the role of uh, rule of law principle uh, for a sound uh, regulatory uh, policy. Yeah, again, a, a terribly important question is, you know, if, if you go through, you know, all of the things that I've mentioned, you know, this is really not only evidence-based policy making, but, but accountable policy making. I mean, if you do develop that body of knowledge, I mean, if you do have some sense of how people are going to be affected by policy interventions, you know, that shows this, this level of, of, of, of accountability that, that really is, is fundamental to, um, to, the, um, to the rule of law. You know, what's interesting is we, we had a really interesting seminar about a year ago on public consultation. And there were a number of researchers at Duke who, these, they're, they're, they're, um, they were both social scientists and also um, from the psychology department. And they did some interesting trials where if, the gov you know, if governments really made an active point 
of talking to all affected parties and informing them of what the policy decision was and what the rationale behind it was, those losers, you know, if you were, were much more willing to accept the decision because they understood why it was being made. And that, I think, is inherently, you know, that, that is good rule of law. You know, you're, you're not going to be able to create laws where everyone wins. You know, but if you are able to convince people in some kind of informed way about why you, you, know, why you are making interventions in the market, there's a good chance they'll accept them. And, and I, I really think that is the sign of, you know, of, of, good, of good governance, of good rule of law, when, when, you know, when there's this collective view within the community that this is the best interest of the community. I mean, that's really when the government you know, is able to govern in the public interest, as opposed, as I mentioned earlier, for private interests. So, so again, it's that, you know, I think that being open and being accountable is, is really fundamental. That's, that's probably the, the lever that gets you quickly to that place of good rule of law. Ben de sunumlarınız için teşekkür ediyorum. İsmim Hasan Erikli, parlamentoda çalışıyorum. Benim şöyle bir sorum olacak. Diğer düzenleyici işlemleri göz ardı ederek sadece kanunlar açısından bu soruyu soruyorum. Zaman zaman biz şunu tartışıyoruz. Kanunların, tasarıların veya tekliflerin parlamentoya sunulmasından sonra parlamentoda geçen süreç içerisinde gerek komisyonlarda ve gerek genel kurul aşamasında halkın e, katılımını e, ne şekilde sağlayabiliriz, nasıl sağlayabiliriz? Bu birinci boyutu, bundan önceki boyutu da şu, e, halkın katılımını e, parlamento çalışmaları devam ederken tasarı veya teklif üzerinde e, sağlamak gerekir mi? Yoksa bu aşamaya gelinceye kadar tasarı aşamasında veya teklif aşamasında bu aşamaların halledilmesi, e, bu katılımların veya analizlerin bu aşamaya kadar yapılmış olması, parlamento ise parlamento sürecinde ise daha çok politika politik tartışmaların yapılması ve e, halkın e, katılımının daha düşük bir düzeyde tutulması mı gerekir gibi bir e, tartışma söz konusu. Dolayısıyla bu OECD ülkelerinde iyi uygulama açısından bakıldığı zaman parlamentoya gelmeden önce muhakkak e, halkın katılımı sağlanıyordur. Ancak e, parlamento sürecinde de halkın katılımı e, ne aşamada nasıl yapılıyor bu veya yapılıyor mu? Yeah, that's that's a good that's a good question. There's almost all of the practices that I've described um, are what executive, the executive part of government does, um, and not so much what happens in, in, the, in the parliamentary setting. Um, there are very few regulatory policy disciplines within parliamentary bodies. So to answer your question, I think it, it's terribly important that as, as a piece of primary legislation is being developed, that it's consulted with both at an early and at a late stage. By, by early stage, we're usually referring to a country that might develop a white paper, might develop some kind of policy proposal where it hasn't chosen exactly what the intervention, how, how the law will take shape, but they, they want to have a discussion with the public about what the problem is. So that, that's what we call early, early, early consultation. Um, so we certainly advocate for that. We also advocate for late stage consultation. So once the law has been drafted, it's put out to the public for what sometimes is called notice and comment. So the, the public takes note of it and they might be able to provide written comments back. And, and so countries do that to varying degrees across the OECD. You know, once, once the bill enters the parliament, you know, sometimes it really goes sideways. Um, there are only a couple of bodies that I know of um, that try to impose some disciplines within the parliamentary setting itself. The European Union has a, has a RIA, like a regulatory impact analysis unit, within the parliament. Um, but it works in the European context because there aren't that many bills that are developed. They're very long time frames, so they kind of know what's coming through the system. But, but the UK and the Chileans do it as well. But public consultation within the parliamentary setting really takes a lot of different shapes. I mean, it's usually 
the bill is then, um, before it comes to a hearing for the entire parliament, the bills usually are developed by a subcommittee of the parliament. And though, you know, for the, for the couple of countries that I've worked with, there usually are open meetings with the public on, on the bill where people can come and provide comments. But again, there's, there are no requirements that, that parliamentarians do anything with those comments. It's just kind of, it's more of a, it's kind of a, like a sort of a, more getting sound bites, if you will. Um, so, so again, it's, but you know, I think one needs to temper this you know, with the idea that you know, in a way, you know, an elected official can say that I have a mandate for my constituency to, to, to, to legislate on their behalf. So they don't, you know, in a way, the amount of consultation they do in a public setting is not necessarily a, a formal requirement of theirs. And again, I think that's why it takes so many different shapes or forms. But again, oftentimes, you know, once a bill enters the parliamentary setting, it's usually just discussed amongst, amongst parliamentarians because they're assuming that the executive has done its work, has done its due diligence, and there's been enough of a consultation, you know, is, is part of that development process. I, I'm not sure if that, that answers your question, but again, there are no formal procedures, or there, there are very few formal requirements for better regulation within parliamentary settings, including on consultation. Çok kapsamlı sunumunuz için çok teşekkür ediyorum öncelikle. Ee, benim sorum birazcık Türkiye'de son dönemde aslında hani belki son 10 yıldır e, bir exception yani bir e, şey olmaktan çıkıp e, arzi bir durum olmaktan çıkıp tamamen aslında sanki rutin olarak kullanılmaya başlayan torba kanun dediğimiz hani belki e, bundle legislation ya da omnibus legislation diye tanımlayabileceğimiz bir e, düzenleme tekniği var. Şimdi buradaki sıkıntı özellikle hani bizim gibi kullanıcı yani bundan etkilenen kişiler olarak kanunların içinde yani meclise gelen bir tasarının içinde NGO'lar içinde yani toplum sivil toplum kuruluşları içinde sanırım aynı endişe ve problem geçerli olsa gerek. Kanunların içinde başlıklarından bakarak ne olduğunu kestirebilme şansımız böyle durumlarda olmuyor. Çünkü hani kanun başlığı bir konuyu sadece en önemlisini yazsa da onun içinde 8-10 tane farklı düzenlemeye yer veriliyor. Ee, benim sorum bu, bu tarz kanun yapma teknikleriyle ilgili bir. Hani diğer ülkelerde bu tarz kanun yapma teknikleri var mı? Varsa e, bu tarz durumlarda hem parlamento açısından... E, düzenleyici etkiyi yani böyle bir düzenlemenin etkisi nasıl ölçülür? Bir de buna herhangi bir çözüm diğer ülkelerde getirebilmiş durumda mı? Çünkü aslında hani şeyi de anlıyorum, motivasyonu da anlayabiliyoruz. Yani bir yandan bakanlıklar kendileri için çok acil olan bir düzenlemeyi en hızlı şekilde nasıl geçirebiliriz diye düşünüyorlar. Aynı zamanda öbür taraftan işte kanun yapıcının, parlamentonun da her bir kanunu detaylı boyutlarda düşünecek, tartışacak bazen vakti olmuyor. Hani bütün bunları göz önüne alınca uluslararası tecrübe anlamında neler paylaşabilirsiniz? There, there certainly are um, many jurisdictions which um, uh, ex exhibit that kind of behavior, and probably the United States is one of the best examples where there, there are very bizarre amendments to all kinds of bills where um, members of Congress are trying to get in their little piece of law regulation. Um, we haven't looked at that, that issue specifically, but you know, back to your point about you know, this being seen as a way to expedite the lawmaking process, one of the best examples of, of a country which has tried to put in place an ex post discipline is, is Australia. So if, you know, in the, in the interest of expediency, um, when bills are introduced to the, to the parliament there, if they have not been um, subject to a proper impact evaluation, there's a formal requirement that one needs to take place in two years' time. So again, you know, it, it's you know, it, you know, I think it's the view that you know any major piece of, of, of legislation which is going to have an impact on, on on the community be at some point subject to review. 
And, and, and, and like I say, it's because, you know, because you're, you know, you're right that oftentimes this is done in a slightly subversive fashion um, where, you know, the, the original intent of the bill is trying to accommodate some other, some other kind of act. But, but again, it's, um, it's, it's trying to put in place those disciplines. Australia is one of the few countries I know that actually does that. In another example is in the United Kingdom. Um, the, you know, some of the practices that I described earlier um, are definitely take, um, take root and borrow from the United Kingdom. The United Kingdom is one of the most forward-looking jurisdictions when it comes to, to better regulation. I mean, they were the ones who invented one in, one out. So the executive has a long-standing tradition of, of doing impact assessment consulting. But interestingly, they also have, a, it's called a, the, the scrutiny unit. They have a kind of a, a unit which does all of these things, again, once a bill enters the parliamentary setting. Again, with a view towards trying to do a little bit of impact analysis around the margins as bills change. You know, again, one of the hard things about doing impact analysis, specifically within a parliamentary setting, is it's so fluid. You know, decisions need to be made quickly. You know, a, a lot of impact assessments, you know, need time. Um, but again, this is where, you know, the requirement that um, a, a ministry, when it does an impact assessment, it might look at two or three proposals and see what the impacts on those are, might also address that kind of problem. Because if, you know, if a bill is starting to go sideways, maybe the government's already looked at some of those options. And again, there might, there might be a little bit of thinking behind it. So again, there, there are a couple of reference points, but not that many. Teşekkürler güzel sunum için ve güzel sorular için. Muhittin Acar, Hacettepe Üniversitesi. Şimdi iki tane sorum var. Birbirle bağlantılı biraz ama. Birincisi yargının özellikle de e, tabii ex post anlamda belki değerlendirme yapıyor ama yargının bu e, regulatory impact analizi, düzenleyici etki analizini ne anlama ve kararlarında kullanma alışkanlığı ya da eğilimi nedir diğer ülkelerde? Birinci sorun bu. İkincisi de demokratik meşruiyet açısından çok önemli. Ee, siz biraz değindiniz ona. Ee, bu compensation of losers diyelim ona biz. Kaybedenlerin, zarar görecek olanların ya da çıkarları zedelenenlerin sürece dahil edilmesi ve meşru görülmesi yani ihanet, e, düşmanlık, gibi nitelemelerden uzak olarak sürece dahil edilmesi hem düzenlemeler yapılırken yasama organında veya idari organlarda hem de düzenlemeler değerlendirilirken işin içine katılması bu konuda iyi örnekler var mı dünyada demokratik ülkelerde? Teşekkür ederim. Thank you for those questions. Um, in regulatory impact analyses are subject to judicial review in certain jurisdictions, primarily in common law jurisdictions and primarily by independent regulators. So for instance, in the United States, when the energy regulator, who is independent of the executive, um, develops some kind of legislative proposal, that RIA might be subject to judicial review. And oftentimes they are. I mean, oftentimes regulated firms Force the regul, you know, force almost everything the re regulator does, you know, to a, to some kind of review. So, oftentimes in many jurisdictions they're gamed. Um, it's also the case that, in, again, in common law jurisdictions, oftentimes the alternatives that are developed within an impact statement might serve as the basis for a challenge to the law itself by some by one of the losers, for instance. So again, it's, um, I, I don't know whether these judicial reviews always result in better outcomes, but again, it's primarily in administrative, um, excuse me, in, in, um, in common law jurisdictions where, where this happens. Um, in, in other jurisdictions, certainly regulatory interventions might be subject to administrative review, but oftentimes administrative courts don't have nearly the kind of power to either overturn a decision or to, to overturn the rule itself. In a common law country, that, that would, that would happen. So, so again, I, I think it's highly selective. Um, on your second question, which is a good one, I haven't really thought that completely through. 
Oftentimes for very, very big structural reforms, for instance, um, pension reform, where the rights of pensioners might be changed by, this, by a big omnibus law, there will be direct compensation in those cases. Um, in smaller reforms, a number of countries have, um, you know, have reformed, for instance, uh, taxi licenses, where companies, you know, an individual might have to pay for the license to, to drive a cab. These are inherently anti-competitive. The government wants to open up the cab market to everybody, so they, they will be directly compensated for the, the, the expenses they made for that over the short run. Um, and, and yes, those, those should factor into, into the regulatory impact analysis. You know, in many cases, firms might not be compensated. You know, you know they, they've, they've kind of, they've been able to capture the market through somewhat, you know, somewhat more illicit means. And in those cases, there should not be direct compensation. But where, you know, if firms are paying a fee to enter a market and that fee goes to the government, obviously that needs to be calculated as a cost. You know, if, if a firm is paying a bribe to an official to enter the market, that's something that you obviously you know, want to discourage and that should not be directly accounted for. But again, it's a good question and I, I, I, I need to look at more RIAs in terms of how you actually calculate those. Just a question up front here. <clears throat> Argun Akdoğan Todayı, konuşmanızda düzenleyici etki analizini piyasanın önüne açmak ve işlem maliyetlerini, transaction costu düşürmek için yaptığınızı söylediniz. Benim anlamadığım şey şu, bu şeyde kullanılan, düzenleyici etki analizinde kullanılan teknikler, fayda maliyet analizi, maliyet etkinliği analizi, risk analizi, sosyal paydaş analizi, bazı alanlarda kültür, eğitim gibi son derece yapılması zor, uzmanların çalışması gereken, Maliyeti çok yüksek şeyler. Yani esasında işlem maliyetini önlemeye çalış, çalışırken işlem maliyeti yaratmıyor muyuz? Teşekkür ederim. I, I think that's a very fair point. Um, one thing I would probably, um, and, and you're, you're already pointing to part of the answer. I mean, I think one needs to make a fundamental distinction between economic regulation you know, again, which allows people into markets and kind of governs how they might behave in those markets, in, in social and in, in environmental regulation, where basically the regulatory intervention is much more towards trying to protect the public from undue harm or for some kind of market, uh, you know, of externality. So again, two slightly different, you know, different ways of doing the RIA. It's certainly, the, you know, it's, it's probably a lot easier to do RIAs purely on market you know, on market, you know, kind of economic regulation, um, which, which you're just going to be looking at kind of, the, you know, the entry costs and potentially what sort of what the, what the effects are, what the beneficial effects would be on, on, on consumers for having more goods or better goods. Social regulation, as you rightly point, is, is much harder to do because those social, the, the social policies are, are, are harder to measure. But, but kind of on, on the issue of like whether, you know, you're creating additional costs by doing the RIA, you know, I go back to that point that I made on, on proportionality. Um, and you obviously want, to, you know, if the regulatory impact analysis, or if the regulatory intervention is going to have a really big effect on society, it's probably worth bearing that cost. Um, it's, pro it's, you know, it's worth looking carefully at what the costs are to affected parties and, and what the benefits are. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd argue that one of the, one of the, most successful RIAs in the U.S., which really changed the hearts and the minds, was around the Clean Air Bill, which um, was developed in the late, the, the mid to late 1980s, which required uh, power industries to put on um, scrubbers, which would limit the amount of toxins, in particular sulfur dioxide, which would come out. And I remember in like 1990 dollars, this was like 400 million dollars. This was a lot of money. Um, the regulatory impact analysis was very time consuming, very expensive, but the study showed that the benefits to better health outcomes was on the order of $2 billion. So basically, you know, it was a, it was a phenomenally good investment in the RIA, and it also provided the evidence to firms to clean up their act, because, you know, th there would be such savings on, on the other end. So again, you know, I think it's like very much this proportional use of resources. You know, <clears throat> If, if the regulatory intervention will, you know, only address, you know, a very small risk, uh, 
that it affects very few people. You know, maybe you don't need to do a full RIA where you, you monetize all the, all the costs and the benefits, but for the really big interventions, I'd certainly argue that it's, a worth an, it's an investment that should be made. Kanaatince Mustafa Diri Başbakanlıktan kanaatince daha iyi düzenleme yapma konusunda ülkelerin kültürlerinin çok önemli olduğunu düşünüyorum. Yani siz bir konuda bir düzenlemeyi çok kısa sürede yapabilirsiniz. Ancak yaptığınız düzenlemeye uymayı nasıl sağlayacaksınız? Yani mevzuat hazırlama konusunda diyelim ki parlamento bir kanun yaptı. Çıkardığı kanuna daha sonra çıkaracağı kanunlarda kendisi uygun hareket edecek mi, etmeyecek mi? Arkadaşımızın söylediği torba kanun örnekleri uygulamaya tekrar girecek mi, girmeyecek mi? Yoksa, yok, e, ayrıca düzenleyici etki analizleri yapılacak mı, yapılmayacak mı? Bu kültürü oluşturmak ve hakim kılmak konusunda neler düşünürsünüz? Konuşmanızda Japonya örneğini vermiştiniz. Hazırlık süreçlerinin çok uzun olduğunu, istişare mekanizmasının uzun olduğunu, tüm tarafları e, kapsadığını. Esasında ülkemizde de öyle bir şey vardı düşünce. Yani bir mevzuat hazırlanırken olabildiğince e, geniş hazırlanır. İşte zaman olarak geniş bir zamanda hazırlanır, tarafların e, düşünceleri alınır. Uygulamaya konduğunda da sert konulur. E, mutlak surette o düzenlemeye uyulması istenir. Ama bizde bazen o kadar acele düzenlemeler yapılıyor ki siz düzenlemeyi yürürlüğe koyduktan sonra uygulamada esnek davranıyorsunuz. Evet o yanlış olmuş ona uyulmasa da olur gibi. Ve böylece siz e, yapılan düzenlemelere olan güveni de bir anlamda sarsmış oluyorsunuz. Dönüp dolaşıp her şey bu yasa yapıcıların mevzuat hazırlama ya da yürürlüğe koyma konusundaki kültürleri, bakış açıları e, noktasında düğümleniyor. Bunu e, hakim kılmak, geliştirmek için neler yapılabilir? Teşekkür ederim. A very, a very good question. I would certainly agree that, you know, changing the hearts and minds of, of the administration to believe in better regulation really is, is, is the central challenge. Um, And, and then I think the second question you asked about compliance and is, is, is also very, very important. On the first issue, again, I mean, I think there are kind of two aspects to it. Um, <clears throat> first is, is oversight. I mean, if you have someone who has coercive power to turn back laws if they're not based around some kind of evidence, if they're not based around some kind of due diligence, that certainly sends a signal to the administration. But that's not enough. I mean, you obviously also want to try to develop, you know, a nucleus of people, you know, within agencies who believe in this, who see its merits, who are willing to make the investment in it. So again, trying to get the top-down approach, linking up with a more organic grassroots approach is, is, is, is, is really very important. It's difficult to do as well. Um, I think, you know, again, I'm going back to the United Kingdom. I think the United Kingdom did this well in that they created a better regulation executive, which was that oversight body. They're the ones who would review um, impact statements as they came through the system. But they also created better regulation, or they helped nurture better regulation units within ministries. So each ministry would have a couple of people who were basically in the legal department of that ministry. They were the ones who were kind of writing laws and regulations. And basically, the, the, the, the, this, the, this central body would maybe three or four times a year have, have a workshop a bit like this. They'd kind of talk through the challenges. They tried to create a constituency within the administration to try to help these people within their own ministerial setting promote better regulation. So again, this kind of a, of a network approach. Also quite importantly, in the UK, once a, meet, once a year, the permanent secretary of the cabinet uh, 
would hold a meeting with all of his counterparts, the, all the permanent secretaries of ministries on better regulation. Again, to try to convince you know, senior civil servants, I mean, really the top, you know, the top brass in each ministry about the importance of, of, of, of better regulation. <clears throat> So again, you know, very much a top-down, bottom-up approach is, is really how you do it. You can't just do it with the oversight body. I mean, I know plenty of countries that, that have a really strong oversight body, and they're, they're beating up on ministries all the time, and you know, that, that doesn't work either. So it needs to be a collaborative, collaborative approach. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but, it, but again, you know, a couple of different ways to think about it, but kind of, you know, maybe you guys will be the nucleus of better regulation in the Turkish administration. I mean, that's really, you know, you, you have to find, you know, you have to find your peers who are developing regulations, who are working on RIA, trying to help them, pass ideas around. I mean, that, that's, that's how it starts to grow. Um, but, it, but again, I would really point to the fact that you need an oversight body that's going to ensure quality. I mean, that, that's, that's a minimum. You know, on the second issue, on compliance, on, on implementation, it's certainly the case, not only in Turkey, but in so many jurisdictions that I've worked with, that when drafting a bill, you know, lawmakers are not thinking about how it's going to be implemented. You know, there's a great example of the, the fox hunting ban in the United Kingdom. So about 10 years ago, um, parliamentarians in the United Kingdom thought that fox hunting is a terrible thing and it should be outlawed. So they created a law to outlaw fox hunting, but they realized like killing a fox isn't a grave crime and it shouldn't be, you know, it shouldn't be enforced by the, by the high court. Local magistrates, so these are kind of county officials, you know, judges at a county level, they, they would be the ones who implement the law. So every Saturday morning, who do you think are the fox hunters across the United Kingdom? They're magistrates. You know, are the magistrates gonna, you know, um, basically uh, arrest themselves? No. So when this law was devised, it had no thought about how it would be implemented. It was, you know, it was, it was a declaration and not much more. So again, you know, what, we're, what we advocate to countries is to really think about how this law is going to be enforced. You know, can you come up with what kinds of outcomes you want to achieve through the law? Can you measure those outcomes? Can you help people understand how to comply with the law? That all really needs to be integral and kind of bundled into the law and shouldn't be done as an afterthought. And again, we have developed some guidance in terms of how you can go away from just kind of black letter law to really trying to encourage compliance with the law. <clears throat>